You're listening to a 58 Ember production. G-I-R-L-S-C-A-M-P, it's Girls Camp. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Girls Camp podcast. I'm your host, Haley Rall, and if you are navigating a faith deconstruction too or are simply fascinated by faith deconstruction journeys by religion generally and Mormonism specifically, then you are in the right place. And if you are fascinated by Mormon names, Mormon influencers, love, we have the guest for you today. I'm so thrilled for this conversation with Emily. You may know her as M Doodles and stuff. That's right. I was thinking about introing you and I just kept having play over and over in my head. Hi, my name is M. I do influencer baby name predictions and baby name consultations. And today we're talking about insert. That was- Really impressive. Thank you. <laughs> because I just watched you do your intro live on the air with no mistakes. And yours was longer than saying, hi, do influencer baby name predictions and baby name consultations. Yours was longer. It was perfect. I had to practice mine and I will still get it wrong sometimes, but thank you. It is funny too. Just, I'm so familiar with your content. You have such a distinct voice and tone and cadence and it's so fun to meet people in real life yeah that you're like oh this is that person it is fun same with you yes I know your voice is the same you look the same (laughs) I know I've been thinking that same thing about you I'm so excited for this conversation we were just talking about this off air we connected over TikTok and you do content about influencer culture, specifically about influencer baby names, which very frequently overlaps with Mormonism, Mormonism, which we will talk about the the whys of that. Anyway, we connected over TikTok and we've been talking about doing an episode. And as I was thinking about what to talk about, I was realizing how much name adjacent content there is when it comes to the Mormon church. Yeah. You think at first it's like, oh, you're just going to talk about weird spellings of the name McKinsley. Mm-hmm. But there is so much rooted in Mormonism with the special name situation. Yes. And I was doing a little bit of research. I'm sure you will know much more than me. But I was like, do we make this up? Do we make up that there's something unique going on about Utah names, Mormon names? It's proven. There's like studies that prove that this is a particular phenomenon yeah. of Mormon culture. So I'm excited to dig into all of that. Before we do, I want to hear, first of all, let's start with some Mormon context, and then we'll do context of how you ended up being so interested in names, doing baby name consultations, all of that. So first of all, if you could just give us some context on your Mormon background, when did Mormonism enter the picture for you? Yes. I think it's funny when I read my comments, anytime I post about a Mormon influencer specifically, and I give some background, some insight, people say, wow, how do you know so much about Mormons? Like, you've really done your research. And it it feels like not many people have put together the fact that I I was Mormon. Um, Maybe they're just not saying it, but most people, I think it goes over their head. As I was, you know, refreshing myself on your content, you haven't really talked specifically about your Mormonism. Yeah, I haven't. This, I would say this podcast is, I don't feel like I can use the word coming out story. There needs to be some other phrase. I know. I always say that. What could it be? I know. I don't want to (laughs) co-opt the coming out, but it does feel, that feels like the closest thing to what it is. It's the reveal. Love it's, it. It's our reveal. Love it. Uh, yeah, I grew up Mormon. I would say I fall into the the vast group of millennial women who were mothers through the pandemic, and that whoop, led me led me other places. And I'm coming out the other side. Yeah, so, there is so many. There is so many. Did you grow up? Where did you grow up? Okay, so I grew up in Connecticut Mm -hmm. and not in a a Rory Gilmore sort of way, more rural area. So not a, not a a coastal grandmother Mm -hmm. aesthetic quite it, you know, we were more the kind of people that did camping in Maine and and Vermont. So if you're looking for wrecks on New York City destination, I have no idea. We never went more the outdoorsy, a little more rugged. Yes. Yes. And the more I've spent around members of the church, I really feel like New England Mormons are the most other of the whole country. I would not be surprised. Have you been? 
I've never been. Really? And as you're saying this, I'm realizing the reason I'm not surprised is because I feel like there's not as much crossover as any other pockets of Mormon communities. That's exactly how I feel. Because obviously Utah, and you kind of have the whole Mormon belt, Idaho, Utah, Arizona, California, the I-15. Yes. Has them all. Yes. And then I feel like there's like the hub of the Pacific Northwest, the Texas. Yep. And then once you get into the South, I don't think there's as many Mormons, but honestly, you look at like Bama Rush TikTok or like really traditional Southern white women. And even though they're not Mormon, aesthetically, it's not that far off. Yes. It feels... <laughs> It feels in the same realm or yeah. world. And also maybe there's just an underrepresentation on the internet even yeah. of, I mean, I can't think of like a New Englander content creator that I follow. Perhaps right. I do, but not that I connect to that specific region. So yeah. maybe that's part of it too. I, I do feel like there are less content creator, hip, trendy people in that area. I don't yes. know, just like, I don't know, more down to earth really regular people maybe less concerned with the really the TikTok though. of it all yeah so new england mormon on my dad's side his parents joined the church when they were in their 20s okay when they were a young family and my mom is a convert who joined in her 20s oh interesting so it doesn't go back that far for no. you and then i uh, my husband is from philadelphia and he's a first generation american his parents also converted in their like 20s. So when I've I've listened to your podcast and people tell their backstory, I realize, oh, I have nearly no connections. The the typical connections. You mentioned like, oh, we went to the same high school. Yeah. Or oh, we went to the same mission. I'm like, yeah. wow, I can I got I got nothing behind yeah. just just my parents. Yeah, I'm I'm happy you're on not for this reason. But I do have people all the time say we need more non-born and raised Utah, Idaho, here California, Arizona Mormons. So here, here we is. are I am in all her glory. So absolutely that. Uh, very, yeah, regular, not, no church roots whatsoever. I was pretty socially awkward as a, as a teen. I wasn't cool. Wasn't like a socially bubbly person. You know, age 16, I was probably at home playing The Sims. That's part of my origin story with baby Sims. names for sure. Absolutely. Makes you sense. Name that baby. Oh, absolutely. That Create a little baby a little, just like you want mm -hmm. them. Give them a name. Yeah. Absolutely. First time I went on a baby name website was to find names for Sims. Mm, I love that as an origin story. It's very uncool, but it's very No, mean. I love it. I'm thinking <laughs> of, are you an Office fan? Uh-huh. The Dwight's Second World. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Every time the episode happens, I'm like, man, is that a real game? Because I actually want to play it. Yeah, it's like Sims, but even better. But you can fly. <laughs> yeah. I want that. I want that too. Okay, that is super helpful context. Did your journey, your Mormon journey, ever land you in the Mormon belt at all? Yes. Like, where did you go to college mm -hmm. and stuff? Yes. So the way I would explain it is that growing up, we went to church on Sundays and then church wasn't really much of our life outside of that. We didn't talk about church. We didn't we didn't go to any of the extra activities outside of Sunday. My parents were like active enough, but then when I entered Young Women's, I feel like I really, really loved it. When I look back at my teen self, I feel like, especially being in New England, there are so few members in your high school. Like there was four, maybe six at most. And that made me feel so special in a time in my life where I really didn't feel special or yeah. have confidence. Oh, that's interesting because I would think it would either be that or maybe the opposite, opposite right? where you're, it could make you more, feel more vulnerable or insecure perhaps. Right. But there nice, was, a, I guess that it was, it was special. Nice. <laughs> yeah. you know, a sense of like, I know something they don't know. And like, you feel like a little bond between the other members and realizing now that I, you know, I've always struggled with social anxiety and, and depression and that sort of thing. And I can see how like my mom and I have never had a strong bond. We've never had like a great emotional connection. And I realized with my therapist, Yay. thank you, <laughs> thank you, Beth. Um, shout out Beth. Shout out to Beth. That when I entered Young, young Women's, the leaders we had were just the most wonderful women, you know, hearty New England women. They weren't 
They weren't they weren't Utah ladies. <laughs> they knew our thing or two. They, 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 the they were just Probably different. Uh-huh. They were, you know, like progressive, politically diverse, really well educated. I lived in the ward closest to Yale. So we had like Yale professors and faculty, just really amazing people. And the young women leaders were so special to me as someone who was very socially awkward, didn't have a great connection with my mom. We were in the church, but not full in. So Young Women's was everything to me. It, it gave me my friends. I feel like by the end of high school, I was more active in the church than even my parents were. And that was because I was so committed to Young Women's because I loved the the culture of it, I guess you could say. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I loved girls camp. Yeah. Well, oh, here we are again. <laughs> here we are. Full circle. Okay. I loved Trek. Have you ever had someone say that? I absolutely understand loving Trek. I feel like I myself, I did the Trek episode. Yeah. And I feel like I was an outlier in the sense that I kind of had a great time at Trek too. I mean, there was elements of it that I was like, this is tiring. This is whatever. But when I was, I was a little bit of a theater. It kind of phased out for me, unfortunately, but I was still kind of in my theater days. So being able to don a bonnet and pretend to be a pioneer. Yeah. I lived for that. Like, I mean, I, I, get I, I wear my, my Kirsten American Girl doll ensemble as often as I can. And tell any me, is, that, is that any different than the Trek outfit? No. Quite similar. I loved that. It was perfect. So anyways, really, really good experiences all through high school. And that just naturally led me to going to BYU-Idaho. Really enjoyed my time there. I felt like BYU-Idaho, at the time at least, had a culture of almost being similar to EFY. It was very, like wholesome and sheltered Mm -hmm, at the mm -hmm. time at least um met my husband there and then came down finished my schooling at uvu so i spent a good amount of time in provo and then after graduation we ended up in minnesota and had our kids there but the way i've reflected since the pandemic all of us were really deep in thought in those in those times is that i i see my journey with the church like uh, I like to use the metaphor of a river, like a mountain river, where at the beginning, at the top, it's like the river is really fast and really deep and really narrow, Str- straight and narrow path. Straight and narrow um, river. The straight and narrow river, where I feel like there were all these goals and things to look forward to and things to commit to, and you knew exactly what they were, whether it was like finishing the, the primary whatever that was, and then young women's personal progress. And then, you know, even in school, like, okay, I finished this grade, then this grade, then this grade, then I graduate. It was always so clear, finish seminary, all these things really laid out. And that river is so fast and narrow that if you're in a raft, you don't have to put in much of your own effort to go down. You know, you've got enough of your leaders and just the community around you that you just you just naturally do those things, even if you're not consciously trying to steer that way. There's a lot of momentum. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Yeah. And I think that really fast, clear river of what to do next, where to go next, takes you naturally into getting married, having kids. And then after having two kids, because, you know, we can't just have a kid. You have to have kids. (laughs) After I had my second baby, which I'm so glad I did, I realized I think I'm at the 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 river has now reached the plains and it's like meandering. It's it's wide and it's slow. It's a little bit more directionless where I have met all of my milestones. I have done it all. I've done temple. I've had kids. I'm married. And as a woman in particular, what else is left? And that's like for many women you reach that point at like age 22. And yes. from there on out, you're just floating. Wow, that's such a resonant analogy. Especially because I think when you get to that point, or at least speaking for myself, okay, I've done all the things. I even did the whole mission thing. Like I did all these things. I'm there. I then kind of realize. This also is maybe not exactly what I was told it was going to be. I worked really hard to be the exact type of person I thought that I needed to be. And now that I'm here, 
this is maybe not enough for me. And this whole life path that has been laid out for me, when you reach the end of it, almost at 20 to 25, as many people do, then you have some time to step back and look around and say, not only, okay, wait, what's going on with culture and doctrine and all of those things, but also to say, is this actually my end goals in life? Is this everything? And I think for many people, women especially, it's maybe not. Yeah. And to to look back, back up the mountain, back up at that river and think, did I even like paddle myself here? Did I make these choices myself? And in many ways, I feel like, no, I didn't because I never considered another route. I'm so happy I have my kids. And I'm so sad that I never, ever considered there's a path to have kids and there's a path where you don't have kids. I never considered that that was even a path anywhere on the map. Same. And I think just knowing you have that choice is so valuable. Even if you'd end up making the same decision in the end, it's so different wondering that that, it's just so hard. Yeah. Just to realize you didn't really, yeah, that's another thing that's so great about that analogy is for many of us, there's just no time to get off the river. You're just moving fast. You're just going. And so it is a strange, often difficult reckoning to say, hmm, how did I even end up here? And why did I not think certain things along the way? You just kind of, it's difficult to explain unless you've gone through it. It's also interesting to hear you share that as someone who's not a Utah Mormon, because I mean, obviously we can't categorize every experience by in Utah or outside of Utah, but it is interesting to hear even being, you know, one of six in your whole school that there's still that same momentum, that same sort of pressure when you are born and raised in it. Yeah. There's, a, there's definitely similarities. Yeah. The contexts are different. And I feel like for you going on a mission, I feel like that makes the, the river even faster. It like shoots you down. I thinking about like the, the, the pressure that mission presidents put on, like, what are you going to do when you get home? You need to prioritize marriage. That stresses me out so bad because especially now with the age change, like boys are going straight from 18, high school, going straight on their mission and then getting married. And like, they haven't even started college yet. And the same is true for girls, very similarly, where you've never, ever, ever been in a position where you were in charge of your own decisions. You went from parents to mission president, and then you're getting married. Like how, how could you possibly know anything about yourself? Yeah. That's terrifying. It's really terrifying. It's so terrifying. Yeah. And so being in the pandemic with two kids, I really just, yeah, all of this just really visualized in my mind. And I also read Melinda Gates, The Moment of Lift. Ooh, yeah. Have you read that? I have read that. I love that book, even though they're divorced. Goodbye, Bill. Bye bye, Bill. I think Melinda's message is still incredible. If I were going to choose a really good quote from it, Please. I would just read you the whole book. But yes. I just chose the shortest good quote. Great. Which was, it is a mark of a society moving backward when decisions are made for women by men. Ooh. And I was listening to your Zelf on the Shelf episode yes. about Scientology, where it's like, you're you're watching a documentary about someone else's situation and realizing, oh, I'm... I'm seeing myself back in that mirror. And for me reading that, I was like, oh, we have that problem. Ooh. We really, really have that problem. Yeah. It's interesting that overlap too. I feel like for a lot of people, there's, I mean, politics is maybe even a reductive way of putting it. But when you get into, I mean, with Melinda Gates, you know, she's talking about philanthropy even. But there's all these realms that if you step into you start seeing those, wait a second, if I believe that wholeheartedly here, which I'm sure most of us do, then when you reflect back on, is that, is that true of my current culture that I'm a part of? And there's lots of different entry points to kind of realizing that friction of things that just seem so obvious outside of the religion. And then when you apply it into the religion, it's pretty clearly not in alignment. Yes. But because it's the religion, we've just gotten used to it. Yes. Anyway. I even even chose this book for a Relief Society book club. 
Ooh. And it was great. I mean, because so many of the examples are third third world countries and, you know, the men need to learn to carry the water just like the women do. They don't realize how hard the women's lives are. Beautiful examples that women in the church could understand from that book and be like, yes. But I always will remember one person at the book club saying, and we are just so lucky that we have a prophet from God so we don't have these problems. Oof. We do. We do. <laughs> we do. We Objectively do. speaking, we do. we do. Yeah. We do. And that's like kind of part of the problem because that's, that's a man telling you what to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Oh, and I just got to throw in, if I had to pinpoint what was the first crack in my shelf, garments. I, you pro- you hear it every day, but garments. Garments. That was the, I, I never, I feel like with my upbringing, church was so much, I just enjoyed I loved like feeling a part of something. And honestly, the the doctrine wasn't as important to me. None of my shelf breakers were necessarily doctrine related. When I read the CES letter, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, okay, yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Checks happened. out. Oh, okay. <laughs> but garments was the first time that I felt like like my righteousness was not enough to help me through the hardest thing I had ever been given. And it's so easy to like shrug it off. Like it does, it doesn't seem like a valid enough reason to be so upset where it's like, you'll get used to it. Like just give it some time. It's a small price to pay Yeah, for eternal salvation and mm-hmm. keeping your covenants. And I never got used to it. And every year it felt worse. And I got to the point one summer, maybe five years in, where I remember laying in bed at night and thinking, I dread the rest of my life because of this. It feels maybe a touch too far to say, I can't wait for my life to end, but there was a sense of, I, I, I cannot fathom life because I feel like I am wrapped in saran wrap. I have tried everything. I am miserable. I am fixated on them at all times. And so that being the first time where the church really felt like it it hurt me, led me crumbling and ended up here unraveling. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you mentioning that about garments because I will preach till the day I die that garments are a really big deal. They are a really big deal for so many reasons. That's the thing. There's so many layers of mental health, physical health, of spirituality, of body image, of sexuality. There's so many layers to it. And it still surprises me how, you know, almost the worst thing because I've been seeing, for some reason, my algorithm is sending me garment. Garment friendly outfits. And it really does. I, I live and let live. I'm not commenting. I'm not saying anything. But I see in them me convincing myself of something I knew was not true. Yeah. <laughs> Conv- and of the garments specifically. Of a lot of things at that point. But of the garments specifically. Of all the things I told myself. Essentially gaslighting myself into saying, no, it's, it's fine. It's okay. It's okay. When it always just felt wrong. Yeah, just actually wrong and doing something a daily practice of what you put on your body that feels wrong every single day that takes a toll yeah. in so many ways. I used to wish I would have yeast infections because that felt like a valid reason to take them off. My my struggles were very very mental. I know now I have ADHD and I know I have sensory processing mm. struggles and that just feels not good enough of a reason to take them off if you're faithful. But I was like, ah, yeast infections. They've really, they've really got a good reason. No, truly. Like, who's going to argue? Sorry, I have a yeast infection. (laughs) They're like, like, it just doesn't feel good. Yeah, right. I'm depressed. They're like, ah, suck (laughs) it up. (laughs) Ah, thank you for sharing all of that. I love hearing about your story because as you were saying, I think obviously a lot of that comes through in the things that you commentate on. But hearing that background is really powerful. So thank you for sharing all of that. I'm happy to share it. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm sure more will come out as we continue discussing. The next thing I want to ask you is how did you get so interested in names? Sims. Let's start off. There we go. Start off we strong did, with Sims. We did start with Sims. Taking me from AOL to the baby name websites. <laughs> just It was always there. And honestly, 
the reason I started posting on TikTok that very first video was because I was so interested in what people were about to name their babies. And I felt like I didn't have anyone in my real life to talk to about it. But at the same time, I was always like, well, doesn't everyone like this? Like, isn't, I didn't realize it was a special interest. It's a special I interest. Genuinely yeah. had no clue. I was like, yeah, that's so fun. Well, I feel like what's so cool about the niche of names is everybody is interested, but obviously you are especially interested, but it's something that actually has mass interest. Yeah. But just a lot of people don't really know that much about it. Right. That's why I love watching you talk about names is because I realized too, part of what I've realized is, oh, there's some of these things when I think about names that I've sensed intuitively, but I haven't been able to trace origins or this name is the sort of male equivalent of this name, mm. but you can kind of sense those things. So to hear you articulate it is really, really fun and satisfying. And so I think it's such a great special interest to have because it is a special interest, but yet everyone is really intrigued by it. Thank you. I really, I have to thank TikTok. TikTok has like, uh, overwhelmingly a lot of bad qualities. But I will say I have genuinely discovered some of my like gifts, talents, interests, because if you only know your own head and I so simply perceived that the way I think about things is the way other people think about things, which is very, very simple and very naive. But truly people would be like, the way you think is amazing. And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like mostly dumb. <laughs> you're Are you ob- sure? You're absolutely not. I think what's so fun about TikTok too, you are so funny. I've said this to, to you a million times. My husband and I were binge watching while a little stoned and having the time of our lives. Perfect. I think you have that type of sense of humor that I can imagine you would maybe wonder if it might be surprising that so many people have that same sense of humor. And that's what I love about TikTok is I will see a video with 2 million likes and I'm thinking, oh, I would have seen this and thought I was the only person who found something like this funny. Yes. And that's what feels so, it it really does, to your point, there's many, many drawbacks, but TikTok particularly gives me this sense of human connectedness yes. in that way. I agree. And it's really fun to be like, oh, we all kind of have these weird little niche senses of humor that somehow collide. Yep. Did you, so you now do, we were just talking about this as well, but you now do obviously TikTok content, but you also do baby name consultations as a full-time job. Yeah. How did you kind of transition into that? People were asking for it. From TikTok. From TikTok. They said, if you're able to, to perceive influencers like this, could you do that with me? Could you look at my Instagram? And I was like, oh, absolutely. And I quickly realized it's the exact same process, whether it's an influencer or a regular person. All I really want from a client is if they have other kids, I want to know their names. I want to know any names they like but won't be using mm. and why. And then I want to see their Instagram. And that that's all I need. I maybe, you know, honestly, I feel like it's a double-edged sword where maybe one of my bad qualities is that I'm judgmental <laughs> but the the like that same quality in a positive light is like oh you're very perceptive you can really make I'm good at making assumptions mm. which, uh, yes I good no, I think it can be a great thing especially because the way you do it I don't think it's for any nefarious reasons <laughs> you know right plus I think you're really good at categorizing when it comes to aesthetics when it comes to even I just rewatched my favorite video of yours, which is about the Hawaii Mormon influencers. Uh, And there's so many good points of that. I wish we could just break it all down. But you do a really good job of categorizing like what makes all these people similar to each other and where do they overlap with these kind of Mormon influencers. And I feel like that just satisfies the brain to categorize in those ways. It's fun. It's super fun. Yeah. I want to start out because you texted me this and I said, hallelujah, by talking about my own baby names. Yes, yes, yes. I'm so curious to hear your thoughts. I'm going to give you the, in a nutshell, story of how we arrived. This is my favorite thing. Okay, so we have twin girls, Clementine and Maude. The story is, all growing up, I said, I'm going to have a baby girl first and I'm going to name her June. June was my number one name. Literally, I could probably find a second grade journal where I'm writing June with the last name of like my crush. 
June is my grandma's middle name, my dad's mom, and I was born in June. And oh. I always felt really connected to it. Then, of course, I was no longer a child. I'm getting married. I still really like the name June, but I started seeing it pop up a little more. Then I'm trying to get pregnant, going through infertility, and I'm seeing it pop up even more. So I'm like, okay, shit. People are starting to use June where I feel like, which probably all the little girls my age also liked that name, which is why they then grew up and named their daughter that. Anyway, I was like, oh, I thought this was such a unique name. I'm a Haley, so I always really wanted a more unique name myself. I wanted more unique names for my kids. I'm also battling the Utah-ness of like, I want them to be unique, but not too unique that they're strange. Anyway, once I get pregnant, I just was like, I don't think I can do June as a first name. It just feels too popular right now. So then we're kind of back to square one. I have this list of names. The only name that I had picked out for sure when I was pregnant was Louisa. And I love that name so much. I love it from Sound of Music. Yes. I served a mission in Germany, which kind of connected back to Sound of Music Mm -hmm. as a kid. I delivered at 34 weeks, so we did not have names picked out yet. And we decided to call baby A, who is now Maud, Louisa in the NICU. Oh. So they had it written out, everything. There was Louisa and baby B. And every time we went to the NICU for a day or two, they were calling her Louisa. Yes. I was going to ask you if that was a part of it. That was part of it because I just thought, and it's not if you're, if anyone out there listening is a Louisa, goes by Louisa, whatever. It just was such a different name to me. It was such a different sound and feeling about it. And I was like, I don't want to spend, I don't want her to spend her whole life. I don't want to spend her whole childhood saying, sa, Louisa. Because I genuinely don't know if it's a pronunciation difference or like a regional dialect Ooh, almost difference. Interesting. I ask, I always ask, is it Louisa or Louisa? Is it Wesley or Wesley? Because mm. I think a parent of those names have strong opinions. Yes. Well, I know that Sophia Richie Grange, I believe, mm-hmm. she just named her daughter Eloise. Eloise. Oh, or see, is it I, Eloise? I would say Eloise. Okay, so maybe it is Eloise. I have no idea. And I actually like the Z sound better for Eloise, for Eloise. than I do for Louisa. Uh-huh. But I also still prefer Eloise over Eloise. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's an yeah. interesting thing. Yep. But I uh, was just like, no, I'm not going to do that. So then we're back to square one again. We still have two names to pick out. We have a list. I knew I wanted to do June for a middle name. I did really like the name Clementine and obviously really liked the name Maud. Twins are hard because you want them to match to an extent, but I didn't want it to be kitschy matching. And ultimately, I feel like they they match in a sense. The one worry I've had about their name since naming them is I kind of wish there wasn't such a disparity in syllables. Clementine mm-hmm. three, Maud one. Like I kind of wish they were closer in syllables. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, with both names, we were just like, what are our two favorites and which one seems more like a Clementine and which one seems more like a mod? And I felt like they fit in this sense of Clementine could kind of go either the nature-y yeah. floral way or it could go the like f- classic French way. Yes, like a vintage yes. French. Yep. And I feel like mod brought it to a vintage French place. And yeah, I feel like that's totally. kind of where they align. Yeah. Where... I didn't want to do Clementine, like some of the other names. I actually really like the name Daisy, Mm. but I was like, that's feeling way too cutesy, floral-ish. Yeah. So anyway, it was interesting to try and like kind of balance out the names with each other too. That absolutely makes sense. I I feel like um, right now, if an influencer was having your twins, it would be Clementine and Marigold. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It's like, they're both nature- One's fruit, one's flower. But that's still, I think you did a really good thing having them be not both organic things from nature. Thanks. I think that was a really good choice. Well, because I also consider Juniper instead of June. Juniper, call her June. Mm -hmm. But then Clementine and Juniper, it felt too, for my sensibilities, (laughs) taste is probably a better word. It felt too hippie, maybe, is a way of saying it. And too... Yeah, it just was like too naturey, and that's why I feel like Mod, which I've always really liked the name Mod. The one thing about Mod that has been interesting, 
a lot of people don't know it as a name. Interesting. People will say at the pediatrician, they were like, Mauda? Mauda. And I was like, Maud. And they're like, people, I, I've been surprised that people don't recognize that as a classic name. It is a very classic. Right? It's been around as long as baby name data for the U.S. has been around. Okay, that yeah. makes me feel better. Not yep. necessarily that it needed to be, but I was like, is this a crazier name than I originally no, thought? it's not, because I, w- I was doing research, and in 1880, Maud was at spot 21 in popularity. Really? That's really high. Tell me about Clementine. Clementine has always been lower, but it's also always been around. Maybe like in the, like the 300-ish mm. range, definitely like... 1880 1900 was higher kind of really disappeared and now it's like a little bit way back up. up yeah okay that actually makes me feel good because that's I didn't know mm-hmm. which is why I think your services I was telling Bentley I'm like oh, I wish I knew Emily back then but I think your services are so valuable because again names are a big deal yeah you're naming a human being for the rest of your life it's a big deal you want it to fit you want it to feel right And I am happy with the names that we chose, but there's a lot of things that in retrospect, I wish I would have just had more research on. I just think it's nice to know, to kind of confirm like, okay, these do kind of fit together in this way. And so anyway, that's nice to hear. I think the Clementine and Maud, something that's been nice since having them is, I know a lot of people will have kind of a more unique name and then they're kind of at the top of that and then all of a sudden it's actually a quite popular name yeah (laughs) and so I've been happy to see that I don't feel like there's I know Clementine I feel like I've heard of one of like a a friend of a friend but it doesn't seem like there's any like huge influencer who's never gonna be a top 10 yes no I do know one of the secret lives of Mormon wives moms she has a daughter named Maud and that was actually I knew a girl named Maud in high school that's when I first heard I knew two Mods in high school and they were both so cool like vintagey, perfect, thrifty girls. Ah, yes. So I love that name since high school. But yeah, her name is actually Demi. What's her Instagram handle? Anyway, oh, she has yeah. a daughter named Maud. No and way. Yeah, that's the only Maud like in my sphere, in sphere. really that I even yeah, know. Yeah, I honestly, I don't think I've ever encountered another Maud. Mm. I don't know any adult baby. I've never encountered one. Yeah. But I will say when I first heard your girl's names, first, very first thought is, Haley is a person who has put thought into this. Like you didn't just pluck out something top of your mind. Like I could tell you put a lot of thought in, into the, the, the choice. Thank you. You wouldn't just naturally be like, I don't know, Clementine and Mom. Yeah. <laughs> you yes. really, you were definitely thoughtful about it. Thank I you. I can absolutely tell. Now my question is, I always think it's going to be Clementine and Maeve. Or Margot. Ooh, Margot was one of our top was names. Was it? Margot was actually one of our top names. Was and I, it? Yes. I forgot about it. We were considering Margot pretty heavily. I think I don't love the the G sound very much. I, 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 it's not that I don't love it. I still really like it. I think that's ultimately... I, that's why I would prefer Maeve over Margot. And I think Maeve and Maude are really similar. I also considered Maeve. But Sex Education had just came out. And one of the main characters' name is Maeve. And I was actually searching and seeing that it was like gaining quite a bit of popularity. And so I felt like Maude had a bit more of like a classic twist. Maeve felt a tad bit more trendy. I completely agree. I think you've got Maeve, Margot, Marigold. Those are all, they're, they're, they're still unique and still vintage and beautiful. But then Maude is like, a class of its own. It's way over there. It feels a little more like posh, it maybe, does. which I feel like helps it meet Clementine, which has like a very feminine feeling. Mod feels a little bit more like cool in a yeah. sense. Um, but yeah, that's funny because we did consider both Margot and Maeve that like pretty funny. heavily. Who, yeah. Who got the middle name June? Clementine June. Cute. And then Mod's middle name, this is probably a wild card, will probably surprise you. Oh, I don't yes. know if I posted it. It's Wiley. Whoa. Yes, because Wiley, W-I-L-E-Y, that is Bentley's grand, well, it's his older sister's middle name and then his grandma's maiden name. So, no way. Yeah. And we actually considered that for a first name, but it was just so in a completely different universe. That's fair. That it just it didn't really make sense. I think it's a really, it's more 
unique than I think I would ever go, but I think it has a really pretty sound. I really it like does. the sound. It does lightly. have a pretty sound. And middle names, that's like your that's your wild card. Put whatever you want in there. Any name that you love, but you're like, oh, but I like I couldn't actually name a baby that. That's what middle names are for. That's kind of how we felt. And I feel like Clementine, it's such a big name that June just kind of popped right in. But Maud, we had a little more room yeah. to do something different. Yeah. Also, our last name is Rawl. So I didn't want to do Wiley Rawl. I actually considered the name way back post right after my mission to Berlin, the name Berlin. Ooh. But then someone immediately said Berlin Rawl. Berlin Wall. Oh my <laughs> Can you goodness. imagine? They were like, Berlin wait, they like Wall. thought we were joking. They were like, you can't name your kid you Berlin Rawl. <laughs> that's really good. So that's fun to get your thoughts that on the twins really name. I've always wanted to ask you about it. Yes. They're just really fun to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think they, it suits them both really well. And it's fun to see what nicknames come mm. to. Anyway, okay. We have so much to get into so around much. the Mormon names. The first thing I want to talk about is... Utah Mormon names. There's been jokes. There's jokes as old as the internet goes back. McKinsley, Brinley, B-R-Y-N-N-L-E-I-G-H. There's always been jokes about the Utah mom that has Tinsley and Brinsley and Brax or whatever. Of course. What are your, what do you know? What do you know about these strange Utah, maybe not just Utah, Mormon names? Where did things get so unique? What's going on? That is a great question. I will first say that the the joke of like, haha, crazy spelling, honestly, I'm kind of tired of it. I'm like, let's get more creative. It's just boring. It's boring. It's just, it's kind of like making like, how many moms did you have? It's like, <laughs> yeah. okay, you have a fair point. Yes. Absolutely. I'm tired. We've yes. heard the joke so many times. Yep, I agree. And there's so much more interesting things to discuss. Like, Amen. There is absolutely some crazy spelling of Everlyn Paisley, whatever out there. They do exist, but it is so much more complex than that. And I, I do think there is a wide range. Utah is just so trendy. So like whatever names are trendy, we see the most of them here. Like right now, Indy, Isla, Crew Banks. I think Utah has way more of those than any other place. Just like I think there's probably more Stanley Cups in Utah than any place. Also, just more kids, right? And just more kids. More w- more people having more kids, yeah. so more names to be given. Exactly. Okay, that's really. I think there are so many factors into why Utah has unique names. I think there's so many valid reasons, but the one that I like. To think about, I have absolutely no evidence that this is true, but I really think, okay, first you got to think, why are there more unique names in general now overall? I think the internet is a huge part of that because it grows our social circle, even just of acquaintances, so much more. When our moms were having kids, they didn't keep in touch with like their roommate's sister that they met one time but you and I might follow that person on Instagram you you didn't necessarily know kids names outside of your family and your neighborhood so I think the internet makes it feel like that name's been used that been that's been used that been used and it 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 blossoms into some really unique places keeping that in mind I think Utah Mormonism has already always had a larger social circle because of the church. Oh, interesting. Like you're yeah. saying, yeah. there's bigger families. And even if, you know, even before we had the internet or cell phones or anything, you knew the names of the kids in your family. Your family was huge. You know, you maybe you came from a family of eight and all of them had six kids. That's already so many kids in your family. So many names off the table already. Your neighborhood also had probably five to to 10 kids. Mm -hmm. And then you factor in, then you went to church 
and you had connections with people you wouldn't otherwise know through visiting teaching that that's like just forming more and more connections and then do you remember did you have like a stake directory like a paper yes. one yeah. yes so you could go through and look at everyone in your state with a picture with a picture all oh. the names oh, a grainy picture a yes, very a very grainy, very black grainy. And white photo. yep <laughs> but you got to know everyone in your stake and I think that is just something that the the typical person outside of this culture didn't have that complex of a web of acquaintances. We have that now because of the internet. Mormons have kind of always had a larger social circle. And if that's the case, I think it's like, well, there's already three kids named John in our family. There's, you know, and I think that's where you get into the different spellings and just expanding out into new unknown ideas much Makes earlier. so much sense. I'm also thinking to take that even a bit further, I'm thinking of the role of motherhood for Mormon women and how for many Mormon women, that's their only realm of powers, maybe the wrong word, but their only authority Women, I mean, sh- certainly the men chime in on names as well, but maybe that's one of their places they can exercise individuality and creativity mm-hmm. is in naming their own children. And so especially when they already have so many names in their connected pool, as you said, then they're maybe going to get particularly that way because that feels like a way that they can exercise individuality is this is Ashley, but it's an L-E-I-G-H. And that is different. And that's like an expression thing in a culture that there's maybe more limited ways of expressing that, especially for women, especially for mothers. When I was active, I really valued the messages of the the value of creativity. And it, it was particularly geared towards women. You are so valuable as creators and creating things and beauty is so special that you can do. And, you know, if I think of a Mormon mom in 1980, maybe her hobbies are scrapbooking and quilting and baking. And she gets to name her kids. Uh Uh-huh. So she's going to maybe go a little crazy. (laughs) Go a little crazy. No, I think that's such a good point. I was thinking, too, with that same theory how influencer culture has probably very much affected that phenomenon. Yes. Because I know for a fact, I mean, after speaking of Sophia Ritchie again, she named her daughter Eloise and there was immediately so many people on TikTok. Oh, that was my name. That was my name. Not even because they weren't going to do it anymore, but because they had to say, I'm not copying her. Yes. I also had that name. And I think there's something to feeling like you don't want to feel like you're copying, but we are so much more influenced now. Absolutely. So it's this tricky balance of allowing that influence, but also wanting to set yourself apart. And then this weird thing of like, okay, now anyone who names their child Eloise, for example, is going to feel like for the next couple of years, well, I wasn't copying Sophia (laughs) Ritchie. Yes. And it's like, go back a decade, you wouldn't even know who she was. You know, it's like, it's just the internet has a very powerful grip on us. It does have a very powerful grip. Yes, that is so fascinating. I feel like that, yeah, definitely rings true. I saw this, I should have sent this to you. I saw a TikTok of someone going through. There were names from, it was some San Pete Rodeo. Rodeo. Don't Did you worry. see that? I got sent it plenty of times. Okay. I, yes. yes. That's, that makes sense. Yeah. I also feel like that's kind of a separate thing because then you're adding in a different element of region where people live. Yes. And those names were so interesting. Those were all in the realm of steel and I'm trying to think what other yeah, names what are on there. there. Like rowdy yeah. or names like that. Yes. And so it's the same phenomenon, I think, happening, but with this different flair, because yeah. you also start seeing the values of these of people coming out. Absolutely. They want a boy to be rowdy, rowdy. and mm-hmm. steal. And so it's interesting, too, when you see names that are pretty closely related to toxic masculinity or whatever might be these underpinnings of the culture's that these names are coming from. Yeah, and I think regions is a very overlooked, underlooked? Overlooked. Overlooked. Regions is very overlooked, where the Utah Draper moms are not using the same names as 
what is it? What's down in Southern Cedar? Sanaquin. Oh, Cedar Sa- Sitter. Oops, let's do, no, let's do Sanaquin. <laughs> they are not using the same names as Sanaquin moms. There is a, even though they're both Mormon and they're both in Utah, that's night and day difference. I firmly believe that the names that are always in the jokes, the McKinsleys and the Everleys and the Dax and Pax, those fully exist in rural yes. Utah. You take that I-15 down, you go to St. George, and then you just kind of disperse out of there. They are full alive and well. Those stereotypes are thriving. Absolutely. Still to this day. Absolutely. And I feel like there was more of that, more so more widespread, but has definitely trickled out. Yes. But yes, still definitely happening in certain pockets. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about influencer culture for a bit, about the overlap of Utah Mormonism and influencers. And I love asking people this question because I don't think there's a lot of good research on it. And this is one of those things that everyone kind of has an armchair expert theory on. And I think there's lots of different theories. So as someone who is very involved in that world of influencer, influencer culture, what is your theory on why there is such a large overlap between influencers and Mormonism. There are so many good theories and they all have some nugget of truth. I've heard the, you know, we're encouraged to journal. I've, you know, there's, I think that's completely valid. My take, my, my armchair take is I think the average age that you start your family is a very big factor. I think of it this way. Imagine there are, it's, it's a 2010 and two women start a blog, blog spot. One of them is a girl from Connecticut who's about to go to grad school. One of them is in Utah, and she's getting married and having kids. Which blog am I more likely to be fascinated by? You're 20 years old, and you're what? And she's gorgeous. She's so hot. <laughs> And she's having kids, and it's baffling, it's fascinating, depending on the person, it's admirable, it's aspirational, or people will read it because they hate it. Whereas a sensible grad school girl, it's like, okay, that's nice, it's good for you. But like, which blog am I looking at? Totally. I think just since the beginning, there's been a natural, more more clicks, more clicks on the Mormon lifestyle, whether you approve or disapprove. It's It's, interesting. It's interesting. And it does have the element of controversial. It's controversial as well. I think I see some of these, you know, there's so many and I won't name them by name, but there's some of these influencer families where you see more and more over the span of their tenure on the internet they're so clearly leaning into the controversial nature of it as well. Like that's kind of their whole shtick is, and I've done this myself. I've leaned into, I got married at 20 just because I know that's going to hook people to then say I left the church or whatever. But there's people really leaning into, I mean, there's some families where their whole thing is the two parents stand there and then two kids come in and then the two other kids and then the two other kids and it's Jax, Jason, George, (laughs) Jenny, whatever. And that's just, that's their whole value add is look, we have nine kids. Yep. And people eat it up yep. because they either think it's fascinating or they think it's, oh, cool, you're doing God's will, or they think this is really crazy what's yeah. happening here. So maybe we could say 2010 Blogspot was the original rage bait. We're just 100%. like, what, what is this? And they flourish. Yeah, they it works. income, it works. It works. It's fascinating to see. I love your content on this too. I think talking about influencers is always really complicated because... I mean, you and I qualify as influencers. We are very different types of influencers. I mean, even from each other, Mm -hmm. especially from the ballerina farm, Mm -hmm. from, you know, whoever you could name. There's so many different types of influencers. And I do find a, not significant maybe, but I do find a portion of influencers to do problematic things. I think there's child exploitation. That's a huge problem in the influencer community. I think there's overconsumption, but I hesitate sometimes to even speak about those because it's so dependent on which little tiny realm of influencer you're talking about. And there's so many now. Yes. There's so many. There's so many. I cannot believe when I started doing this, I was like, oh yeah, you know, the influencers, 
Rachel Parcell, yes. Amber Fillerup. Yep. And now I get I get comments or um DMs every day. Can you do an, a prediction on this influencer? And I'm like, who? Yeah. I've ne- like and and then they have like a million followers. Yeah. How is it possible that I've never heard of this person? I know. Happens daily with so many. There's just so many influencers and I I think it's been around long enough that a a new influencer can can look at the framework ahead of them and it's like, okay, so when I get pregnant, I make this kind of video. It's like, we're going to do baby names we like but won't be using video. We're going to do a gender reveal with uh, the the smoke. We're going to do, you know, nursery haul. It's like the framework is there. And I think we're at a point where there's, it's really lacking originality yeah. in many places. Yeah. And even with lacking originality, there is such profitable income to be made. And that's where it gets really blurry. It's like on the one hand, I'm like, that's awesome. You can make an income from home just like linking Amazon stuff. Good, Go for it. Uh, yeah, go ahead. But when it involves your family mm-hmm. and your kids, it gets really gray. It gets really gray. I think that there's my kind of constant little wrestle between is it girl bossing or is it I do think a lot of times commentary about influencers can get misogynistic Mm. it can get very you know we're maybe asking questions of this primarily women dominated field that we would never ask men if they were making that amount of money doing whatever it was but it is different because it's it's showcasing a lifestyle. And so many of these influencers are lifestyle influencers. This is why I I definitely cross over into that realm, but I really try and keep the focus of my content around my thoughts and ideas and opinions, not on my lifestyle, what I'm doing with my kids, keeping it hopefully more centered on content around a subject that I have things to say about as opposed to just my lifestyle generally. Absolutely. And I don't think all lifestyle influencers are problematic at all, but I do think that that tends to get more gray more quickly because of those reasons that you described. And yeah, it's something just utterly fascinating to witness. And I'm always on the edge of my seat just to see what the future of it is. Mm-hmm. I listened to a, a YouTube video of of someone who comments on influencer culture and they made a really good differentiation between content creator and influencer where a content creator has a thing like like a like a a platform like you I think you are content creator Mm. more than influencer because you started as a podcast that had a clear goal and anything you do outside of that is in is the supplement yes you're supplementing this end goal, which is to create your podcast. An influencer doesn't really have a thing, like a, like a platform, like their platform is just living. And that is like a little Truman Show-y. Yes. Thank you for saying that because that's where it gets Truman Show because then the lines are blurred between living and content creation. Yes. And are you living to create content or are you just creating content of how you're living? Exactly. And, you know, to each influencer their own, I think there's ways you can do it where you have really good boundaries and you can do it in great healthy ways. But I do think that's where it gets tricky is, is this person cleaning their whole house to make a video of it to sell a cleaning product or are they just cleaning their house and they're filming themselves? And we don't really know. Like it's not really necessarily even up to the viewer to understand that. But then you also consider social media literacy and are these 15 year olds watching these influencers and thinking, I can't wait to be a mom one day because being a mom is cleaning my house in this really aesthetic fashion. And it looks so great and looks so this and that when obviously that's not quite the reality for most people. Exactly. Yeah. Really Mm -hmm. an interesting, complicated thing. But I think that theory is so interesting. It makes a lot of sense. younger. And then from there, going back to unique names, I think there are more unique names within Mormonism within Utah because people are having kids younger and your your taste and your style changes over time. And most of my clients, I would say, are in their early to mid-30s. And there is maybe a, a sense of 
stability in their lives. They're like they're not Mormon. Most of them were from like North Carolina. Oh, I would say is like North Carolina, Virginia is where most of my clients are. Cool. So, you know, they've had their career and, you know, they got married at 30 and now they're 32 and they're having their baby. So there's a sense of practicality. You know, they know themselves and those names, this could also be regional, it, they're they're much more classic. They're not turning heads. They're, you know, they want them to be special, but they don't want them to be out there. Yeah. But if you're having a baby at 21 and you don't really know who you are and just think of the way the way you dress at 20 is probably different than the way you're going to dress at 32 same. Your brain's not even fully developed at 20. Not. I was thinking of this too. Yeah, I think some, you know, 21 year olds just go balls to the wall and just think of a crazy <laughs> ass name and they're like, let's do it, which, okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. I also mm-hmm. was thinking about the phenomenon of naming every kid with the first letter and how that's probably much more common in families where there's more kids when you're trying to have some uniting factor to your family easiest way is well let's just guess give them all a j name give them all a b name yeah. and how many families i know that do that which also feels like a little bit of a i don't want to say immature but feels like a a different type of instinct maybe yes th- that perhaps a younger person might be more prone to i don't even hate families that all have the first letter of the first name i think that it's can different. be totally fine when i see a family where everyone has the same first letter to me that's the equivalent of doing a family photo shoot where everyone wears white jeans and denim or sorry white t-shirt denim it's that's a, the same vibe it's a very easy way f- to like create a perceived sense of uniformity where it's like maybe it's too much similarity <laughs> yeah. maybe can we mix in some beige can we mix in some <laughs> some khaki especially Stripes. when we're talking about who's the family 19 kids and counting the Duggar the family they really um monopolized the, the j they monopolized the j yeah. and then you're 17 kids in and you're trying to come up with a j name and mm. then you got to get real crazy really crazy because you've used every j girl name that there is yeah yeah yep okay i'm gonna make kind of a sharpish pivot to talk about book of mormon names i did some research i looked up how many female names are in the book of mormon how many female names are in the Doctrine and Covenants, which for anyone who doesn't know, that's another supplementary scripture material. It's revelations given to early prophets of the church. In the Book of Mormon, three women. Three women in the Book of Mormon. Three female names. Three. Great. In DNC, two. Are you serious? Two. They didn't even mention like all the wives. No, two. There's so many wives. These are the names. Let's see. I wrote them down. In the Book of Mormon, the names are the three it's female be, names. The only one I can think of is Soraya. Soraya, mm-hmm. Abish. Okay. Isabel. Oh. Was a harlot. Isabel, okay. I was like, she's got a different vibe. She's got a different vibe. Mm-hmm. I love that name though. I think Isabel's such wonder, a pretty name. Do, I wonder if Mormons are less likely to use Isabel I wonder if that they associate too. her with a harlot. Yeah. Because yeah. that's the one harlot of... The Book it, of Mormon. But I feel like I know a lot of Isabel's, but Jezebel, that's oh, like, yeah. that's you a don't biblical, touch that. yes. Mm-hmm. But I could be a cool name, for, yeah. not for that connotation. The two women mentioned by, by name in the Doctrine and Covenants are Emma Smith. And then this is an interesting name. I thought you'd have fun with this one. Vienna, <gasps> last name Jack, J-A-Q-U-E-S. Really? And she is a faithful early member of the church. Mentioned in section 90. No way. I didn't look up how she's mentioned. And then Lucy Max Smith is not mentioned by name. That's Joseph Smith's mother, but she's mentioned indirectly as the mother of the prophet. I I had no idea about Vienna. Yeah. Okay, I love that. There's been a few times recently where someone has said they liked Violet and Vivian. Mm. And for whatever reason, they're not using it. I'm like, what about Vienna? Vienna's really pretty. It is. I like Vienna. Yeah, I'm curious. I mean, she was a faithful early member. That's so great. That floats your boat. <laughs> oh, yes. That's perfect. I was kind of surprised. I don't know why I was still surprised. I was thinking there would maybe be 10, at least in DNC. Like a Martha. Yeah. Um, yes. More Emmas. Yes. You would think, I will say actually in the Book of Mormon, they do mention Mary, mother of Jesus and Eve as they're talking Fair. about, but they're not, those aren't actually characters in the Book of Mormon. 
But Book of Mormon names go absolutely crazy. They really do. I even made a list. Okay, please. To discuss. Please. Uh, weirdest. Okay, because I think within the church, there are very, very obvious weird names that everyone talks about. None are coming to mind. There was. What is on your There mind? were brothers in my ward growing up named Urim and Thummim. Oh, Those are not no, Book of Mormon no, names. No, That's no. the name of the translation device Joseph Smith used <sighs> to translate the, the That's golden really plate. Hard. That's really hard. Urim. And Thummim. Urim. That sucks. Yes. But Book of Mormon names, yeah. I mean, Moroni. There's Moroni. Yeah, there's maybe Moroni. even a Nephi. Yeah. yeah. Those are maybe like the top the of mind. The top of mind. So I think the weirdest ones are really, there's some really short ones that mm. are just like, where the heck did that come from? Shez and shiz. Shez and, there's a shez. There's a shez and there's a shiz. There's a shiz. Shiz. They're both, uh, they're both Jaredites. One, shez king shiz military ruler shiz shiz is so poetic because you name a book of mormon character shiz depending on what you believe about joseph smith i kind of think he's just making shit up shiz up shiz. <laughs> he names a character shiz and then now down the line mormons can't say shit so mormons are saying shiz and then there's a book of mormon military leader, leader named shiz. shiz it's just really poetic it's to me really good i and i really love uh, the simplicity of gid or kib or lib now this one have you ever heard there's a character named moron i did know about moron did you my dad would make jokes about moron i forgot about that because isn't really there good. a? I think there's a nimrod in the bible oh yeah maybe but yes moron there's moron and a moron, which I don't know, maybe that one's pronounced differently because it starts with an A, but there's moron and a moron. Moron was a king, but oh, wait, <gasps> moron was a bad king. <gasps> Isn't sense. that good? A dumb king, a moronic king, perhaps. I, I'm dying to know now, like, w how long has the word moron yeah. been around compared to the Book of Mormon? Yeah, me too. It's really good. The Book of Mormon names are really interesting from that standpoint of... Okay, there's a moron and an amoron. There's a lib and a kib. A kib and a lib and <laughs> shiz and shiz. They're pretty close. <laughs> yeah. Which, I mean, names can be, but... That's true. But it's um, uh, Riplikish. Oh. Tubaloth. Pagag. There's just so... I've, I feel like you could just get your um, Scrabble board and just kind of toss them out and see... What comes? Riplikesh. Riplikesh. Whoa. Yeah. Also a king. So, so many kings. I know. So if you're looking for like a really strong name that feels like a leader, you've got Riplikesh. You've got Shiz. Why why so many Nephi's when there's Riplikesh on the truly on the board? In those long ones, Tubaloth, think about the nicknames. Tube. Tubi. Tube, Tubi, Lofty. <laughs> Bali, you can go so many ways. <laughs> I asked you this question over text, which is if you had to use a Book of Mormon name. So let's say for a boy, since that's that's more the options we have yep. here. If you had to use a Book of Mormon name, what would it be? I have answers. I have two answers for boys, two answers for girls. Perfection. Because you can always use a boy's name as a girl's Great. name. Great. Right? Love it. Okay. I genuinely like the name Gideon. I do too, actually. I I am not joking. It was on my short list for my son. I like Gideon. I, like Gide I think it's also biblical. I think it's biblical. I think that's the type of name I could never use because of my association with it. Mm -hmm. But if I didn't have the association, it's a cool name. Do you associate it with the Book of Mormon? Yeah. Mm, see, I think of Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, the musical, uh, mm, where the youngest, cutest brother's name is Gideon. Cute. And cute. It's, it's like Giddy. It's like, oh, he's so happy. He's Gideon. It's nice because it has like a playfulness about it. Like I can see it for like a young boy, yeah. but then it, it ages nicely too, I yes. feel like. I think that's cute. Um, and then... Jonas. Mm. Obviously, you have to consider the Jonas Brothers element, but I like it as an alternative to Jonah. Who was Jonas? Jonas was the son of Nephi. There That's you have great. it. I think I have no qualms. I like Jonas. Jonas. I like that ending as Jonah is to Jonah and the whale to exactly. me. Exactly. Yeah. Jonas is different, and I like the sound of it. Yeah, me too. I, I have no issues with that. Now, for girls, honestly... Alma is a really nice girl's name. Love the name and Alma for a girl. It has been. It has been a girl's name. I've seen 
Mormon or maybe post-Mormon influencer name her daughter Alma just like a year ago. I think it's hard with the, the Mormon component, but names like Alma and Alba are, they're out there to use. And if you could just disassociate the yep. Mormonness of it, it's really pretty. It's really pretty. I have a friend who named her daughter Alma. I love it. I think it means soul in... Is it Spanish? Spanish? Maybe. Yeah. yeah. I questioned myself, but I think so. Bentley and I briefly discussed Alma and I said, I can't, I can't. unsee it from Alma of the Book of Mormon, yeah. but I think it's beautiful. I love it for a girl. It's really pretty. The other one I like is pretty similar is Amma. Mm. Oh, Amma. that's a- pretty. So A-M-M-A-H. Oh, pretty. That's I a Book of Mormon really, name. Yeah. Um, a missionary. Nephite missionary. Nice. So yeah, I, I feel like you could do... Alma is too much because like he has his own book. Mm-hmm. He has his own chapters. Amma... Just kind of, he's in there, but yeah. not too I, heavily. Yeah, I didn't even, yeah. I couldn't recall an Emma. That's really Emma. pretty. I think it's, it's like, you know, it's not too different than something like Hannah, Emma. Yeah, I it's like cute. that. Mm-hmm. Not Replikesh for your baby uh, girl, you know, your future baby girl. If if I had Rippy? quintuplets, we'd have to bring it in. <laughs> Rippy, call her Rippy. Rippy. Kesh, Rippla. Kesha. Yeah, I mean, Kesha. There, oh. There's opportunity. There's really good stuff. Um, I see your notes. Any other thoughts on Book of Mormon names before oh. we before we move forward to temple names? Nope, that okay. was all. I love it. I yeah, like I was saying, doing that research, I was like, there's this is actually really fun. I see how right? your brain could get like That's really good. deep in this because I was wondering too. Another thing, there was a name I wanted to tell you. This was a name that it's my great grandma's middle name, I want to say. Zetha. How do you spell that? Z-E-T-H-A. Really? But I've been noticing in pioneer ancestry, Z names for women. Yes, you're right. That's so yes. interesting. Um, one of the, the temple names is Zina. Oh, I didn't know that. And then I have a friend whose grandma, she lives here. Her grandma's was um, Zona. Zona. Okay. And I, I really like that. I like that. I have a friend who named her daughter after her great grandma, Zenona. Whoa. And now she calls her Nona. So she goes by Nona. That's so But her name cute. is Zenona. I think Z names for women are badass. Yeah. I'm like, that's really cool. I always describe a Z name as zesty, which Ooh. I know also starts with a Z, but there's just like a little extra yes. spice to them. Yes. I really like and that. And the only Z names I really know you know zoe i'm trying to think if there's any that's kind of the only one i zoe remember from growing up the yeah mo- i think that's like the only normal one yeah like you might say zara yeah true i i know that amber filler up really liked my idea of zinnia Ooh, that she named pretty. her pepper but she was like i honestly would consider zinnia. oh that would fit that so well into the amber filler up right world. zinnia Ugh, is really pretty i think that's so yeah nice. there's something about i like zesty because it feels like there's a little edge to it yeah. but it can and i don't know there's something about as i was looking through names because i looked through names of my pioneer ancestry as i was thinking of the twins names and zetha was when i was like that's really cool i don't think i it's too it's too much yeah for me personally but it was an interesting name, which leads us to temple names because you just mentioned Zina. So for anyone who doesn't know, I've done a a whole episode on temples. We're not going to get into all of it. It is interesting how much emphasis there is when you go through the temple, you get a new name and it's a big deal and you're not supposed to tell anyone this name. And then many of us later come to find out that the name is based on the day of the month. So everyone who goes through, they've changed it slightly over time. But for the past, I want to say 10 years, if you go through the temple on the first of the month, you're going to have the same temple name given to you, which you are supposed to keep secret. But you can now just look up these names. So let's talk about the temple names. I was looking through them last night. Same. So many good names. Yeah. I was like, this is actually a great list. There's some really, really pretty names on there. I would describe overall girthy pioneer homesteader names mm-hmm. which are really trendy right now mm-hmm. true the okay the men it's more biblical names but because we only had two you know, three book of mormon women to choose from it's mostly pioneer women names um, yeah that's what gives it a different flair it does because there is some biblical but they're mostly based off the names of like wives of early prophets mm-hmm. and things like that do you want to hear something funny yes um, pioneer farm Sorry, not Pioneer. Ballerina Farm yes. has five daughters, 
four of them are temple names. I was just going to bring that up to you. I only noticed this because of um, Florence, which used to be... Oh, no, Florence is on it now. But I was thinking of Ballerina Farm, and I was looking through all of these names feel very Ballerina Farm coded. Absolutely. Which makes a lot of sense. Francis, yes. Lois, yes. Martha, yes. Mabel is not a temple name, but May, M-A-Y, is. Ooh. Which I'm like, cute. So cute. Um, Flora, yes. Yep. Um, Let's see. Ruby is one, isn't it? Oh, is it? Yes, Ruby is one. If you went through the temple on the 28th, since uh january 2014 i love the name ruby and Mm. one of my friends temple names when we told each other our temple names her temple name was ruby and i was like that's so funny though because what if your temple name was ruby and then you wanted to name your it you don't probably want to name your child after your own temple name but i I was thinking i'm kind of grateful my temple name was tabitha cool and i was like i'm glad that that's never a name i would likely use Honestly, myself. though, I wonder if there are really faithful members out there who think that's an amazing idea. You're right. They probably think the exact opposite. I genuinely opposite. think. There might be loads of kids named after their parents' temple names. According to this list? There is. All of them. Yeah. <laughs> Every single <laughs> one. All here. Um, what are some of your favorites from okay, this list? Let me look at the current list. It's such a funny mix of gorgeous and then dumpy Mm -hmm. back and forth back and forth Mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. um we get ruby but then we get like donna and eunice and eunice i don't know they're not they're not terrible but like would you rather be norma or would you rather be florence Mm -hmm. you know i think my favorite Ooh, my favorite i really do like may and flora flora is so pretty i really love may I really was surprised by, but really love, I love Lydia. Oh, yeah. Lydia's on the list. Naomi is on the list, Mm -hmm. which I really like. Claudia. Claudia. I really like the name Claudia, but I like it in the European. I like Claudia. Ooh. Claw. I don't like the claw sound as much, but I think that name is really pretty. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's some super classic. I mean, Abigail, Martha, Mm -hmm. Eliza, Mm -hmm. just some pretty classic ones and then yeah you kind of have the like what you would imagine a like grandma is named like yeah, norma norma donna <laughs> i was really hoping to find the ballerina farm boys names on the list and like just be like have this amazing set of just, data ah. but henry charles and george no 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 because these the boy the male temple names are so biblical like saul mm, uh Job. lazarus Barnabas? Barnabas. Barnabas. Jethro. That's an interesting one. Yeah. Ether. Ether? E T H E R. Ether? Ether. Um shoot, if I had to choose one of, like and then like Jesse, which I'm like, no, that's a teen from 1991. Where did Jesse come from? Yeah, what's he doing there? there. Simeon is kind of cool. Yeah, I do cuz like I think of Simon. Simon mm-hmm. is like a cool name. Joel, again, that's very 90s. Did you look at the website that's like Temple Name Oracle? Is yes. that where you got is does your list look yes, exactly like Temple this? Temple Name Oracle. <laughs> I'll post it so people can look. Please do. Did you read um at the bottom of the page some of the um insights and like quotes given? I don't think so. Okay, I got to got to tell you some of these things. So, In a meeting with the workers in the St. George Temple, John D.T. McAllister of the Temple Presidency said, with regard to the new names, give easy names to be understood. So this was before there was the spreadsheet. The temple workers back then just chose what they want. So this is like, this is like his name consultation advice. (laughs) He's doing a baby name consultation. He really (laughs) is. So easy names to be understood, scripture names or names not in the scripture. There are many good names of those who have lived upon the earth, which are easy to understand. Don't give fanciful names and be sure they get the new name and that they understand it. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Fanciful names. Fanciful names. names. Penelope. Yeah, I'm like trying to think of I what know, a fanciful. I, know, I really feel like it'd be like Penelope. What's a fancy boy name? I know. I'm thinking something. I don't know why I go to like Elizabethan England right? in my brain. Yeah. But I mean, on this list, speaking of fanciful, I on the current list, Jaffeth. J-A-P-H-E-T-H. 
Tell me that's not fanciful. That's super fanciful. <laughs> yeah. So that advice feels so interesting. Very interesting. Because they really just gave out names and they just like thought about it and like, okay, who do I know? And that, and I honestly. That they just giving their dad's name probably. Yeah, I feel like, like Dave. The, the current <laughs> list still kind of reflects that advice mm. in some regards. Mm. Um, okay. Then there were also some quotes from early pioneer women, like in the 1860s, 1874, talking about, Ooh. okay, okay. Oh, which one should I read? Caroline Owens, My- Owens Miles discussed her endowment and marriage, which occurred on October 24th, 1878, saying that the woman who performed her washings and anointings, and this is her quote, whispered my new and celestial name in my ear. I believe I am to be called up on the morning of the resurrection by it. It was Sarah. I felt disappointed. <laughs> I thought I should have received a more distinguished name. She told me that my name must never be spoken, but often thought of to keep away evil spirits. I should be required to speak it once that day, but she would tell me in what part of the ceremony and that I should never speak it again. She's, She's like, like, Sarah. It's Sarah. <laughs> boring that's actually really funny because i think something that comes up for a lot of people in the temple endowment is you think it's going to be a revelation of a name at the point i got my name i didn't know that the names were like a template but i remember being like hmm like tabitha like what does that say it almost felt like a personality test to me yes and i wasn't so sure if I was pleased with my results of exactly. the person, you wish those temple workers had a BuzzFeed. Quiz yes, in front exactly. Of them. I'm like, do I really seem like a Tabitha? It's like, to you? okay, Haley, are you more of a cabin person <laughs> or a resort person? Okay, what is your Hogwarts house? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, then there's quotes about women in the 1800s being disappointed about realizing that everyone was given the same name, which is fascinating. That even back in 1860. Women were experiencing that same feeling of like, oh, I just realized everyone. There were multiple people who said that one of the other people receiving their endowment that day was hard of hearing. So the temple worker had to shout it. (laughs) And that's how they realized. It was all They're all like looking like, did you also get that name? Like multiple people from 1860. (laughs) had that oh man Isn't that so good oh that is so good okay this last one eliza young wife of brigham young reported that in 1860 or 61 she received her new name and wrote if the mormon doctrine were true there would be a mighty shouting for sarah at that time as every person whose name i have heard was always called the same it was the name that was given to me and i have known many others who received it <gasps> They were talking about their names. Wild. Just the thought of like, oh man, I thought this was going to be really individual, but like we're all just going to hear Sarah and yeah. And half of us are going to be like me. Me. That brings me to my last point, which is to wax philosophical for a moment about names, because I was thinking about the new names of the temple and the lack of female names in the Book of Mormon. There is so much to a name And how interesting it is, because when you get the new name in the temple, that's the name that you're supposed to know in order to get into heaven. And I was thinking, why could it not just be, hey, God, it's me, Haley, it's it's me. Why do we have to have this new name? It feels like a bit of an identity stripping thing. And I thought, am I thinking too much into this? And perhaps, however... It could be anything. It could be a code word. It could be a symbol. But it's interesting that it's a name because of that element of you are now this new name. This is your new name that you will be known by in the hereafter. And I found that an interesting thing to reflect on, just thinking I would probably rather just go by my own name that I've lived in that has been me because that feels like me, not this name that nobody knows except for my husband and can only be like whispered in secret yeah. in the temple. That that information said there was a good chunk of years where everyone was Sarah and Abraham. Every, every, every single every person. Every single one. And that really goes to your point where just are we really individual? Where's our individual worth? To, yeah. To quote a personal yeah, progress absolutely. milestone. 
if we're all just lumped together as Sarah yeah. in the eternities. Yeah. And the thing I even thought when I was a believing member was, you know, if God is a God of love, if I forgot my name, I think he'd still let me in. I'd be like, I, f- I forgot. It was like a really long <laughs> yeah, time ago. Sorry. Sorry, I, but I'm Emily. Like, can I, can we work this out? Can you look it up? Can you look it up? He'd be like, of course. Like, it's not gonna stop you. If you, if you believe that and you believe God is love, I don't think it's yeah. that important. I don't think the first thing an all loving God would say is, what's well, your temple name? Yeah. I thought mine was Phoebe. It's Tabitha. I somehow misremembered. I must have gotten Phoebe as the proxy name the second time I went through. Oh. So I thought mine was Phoebe. And then I actually had to ask my husband and he didn't want to tell me because you're not supposed to stay in the temple. He finally, I was like, it's my name. You can tell me. So anyway, but it was funny because for, I was like, what if I had died and been like Phoebe and God's like, Mm-mm. Mm-mm. failed your test, failed your test. You're out of here. Yeah. It's such an interesting principle. And I'm sure active Mormons would say it's not so literal, which it probably doctrinally is not. But I do think it's really interesting to think about the power of names, what's in a name and how it does contribute, I think, in a big way to culture and identity in Mormonism, especially in these really fascinating ways. Yeah, it really is. Um, I have a surprise for you. <gasps> I have a TikTok draft that is giving Haley Rawl her new, new name. I'm so obsessed. So it's not like what, a gift. what your name should be. It's like your spiritual name, like who I you are. I love that. Okay, it's a draft. I cannot wait. I'm going to post it right now. <gasps> I'm going to post it right now. Here live? Yeah. Oh, I'm I cannot wait. I'm so excited. I've also off air need to ask you about your content, how you create your content because it's so good Thank and it's you. so fast. I'm like, how does she get it so Honestly, fast? The fastness is a lot of editing. Yeah. Taking true. out any pause. I do that too. Between the end of a sentence, the start of a new one. I do that too. I still try and talk fast though. I'm yeah. like, you, I just, I have to have it snappy. Oh, yeah. I cannot wait to watch this. Okay. I think it'll, oh, there we go. There we go. Don't don't spoil it. I'll just hand this This is such a meta moment watching you on the screen. I'm so excited. I do influencer baby name predictions and baby name consultations into today. I'm surprising post Mormon Girls Cram podcast host Haley Rawl with a new, new name. Chatting together for an episode literally right now in her living room, and I'm hitting post on this surprise as we're recording. LDS church doctrine involves receiving a sacred new name as an adult in the temple that you are never allowed to tell anyone else, except in marriage, where women are required to whisper their new name to their husband, but the husband is still not permitted to tell his new name to his wife. In post Mormon circles, it's a well known irony that this temple experience is meant to be extremely personal and special, but it's largely the opposite. New names are decided by a spreadsheet, and the same names are used over and over and over again. As early as 1860, women in the church have expressed surprise and disappointment that this information was withheld from them and that the names were kind of bland. Seems fitting that Haley, podcast prophetess of post mormon discussions, receives a new, new name that is personalized to her. It's like any work I do for a prediction or consultation, I peruse her social media, take notes, and establish the vibe. The vibe, stay with me, is that Haley is a person that should absolutely dress up for Halloween as slutty Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria was a young, sex-positive queen. She was the moment. She was literally an era. The Victorian era, the latter half of the 19th century, is a large fine foundation of the coquette aesthetic, which is all about femininity, sweet yet playful yet romantic, and bows. It's really just actually all about bows. Observe the ways that Haley has explored fashion now that she doesn't have to cover her shoulders and knees, and she's really all about a micro look. Really showcasing the style on her kid-free trip of choice recently to France. I 100% believe that Queen Victoria did the same. Frilly little sets, very sweet yet playful yet romantic little dresses, and there's lace and there's bows. Haley has a recent tattoo of a bow. Very coquette, very Victorian, but she's also still very chill. The fashion is down to earth. She is just plain Haley after all. Also, blessed with a beauty mark in the fanciest place, like Marie Antoinette would kill for that. Maybe she did. Hang on, Haley has twins. The names of those twins are very much going to give insight into who Haley is. The names of the twins are not a reflection of them, like they're babies. The names are a reflection of the parents. You guys, they are Clementine and Maud. From there, jump to Winston Churchill. His wife's name, Clementine. From there, jump back to Clementine's mother, who had two younger sisters named Clementine and Maud. So that Clementine and Maud 1.0 were born in the 1850s, which was smack dabity dab in the middle of the Victorian era. Cross-referencing the popularity data for Clementine and Maud in the US shows that they both peaked in the mid to late 19th century. Again, the Victorian era. Maud even being at popularity spot 21. Circling all this back to Haley is a person who should be slutty Queen Victoria for Halloween. The vibe is fancy 1850s European sex positive queen in her era. Bows, bows, bows. Dabbling in frilly coquette inspired cool girl clothing. Glamorous beauty mark. And so from the powers in me, I bestow Haley. Haley's new, new name to be Henrietta, and I think she'd go by Hattie. 
A combo is fancy 1850s meets coquette with Henrietta, Spunky and Down to Earth with Hattie. And remember Clementine and Maud 1.0 born in the 1850s? Their mother was Henrietta. Their mother is spiritually so very Henrietta, Hattie, Haley, Rawl. Hattie. 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 Obsessed. And it's similar to Haley too. It is. <gasps> I love it so much. Let me give you a hug. That's amazing. I love it. You're the best. Oh my I'm goodness. I'm going to splice that in. Please do. Thank you for being here. As you said, people say, I love your mind. I Thank feel like we could have gone on and on and on. Truly. Next time you're in Utah or I happen to be in Minnesota, yes. you will see me there. I love that. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us. And thank you all for listening. Bye. G I R L S C A M P S Girls This has been a 58 Ember production. For more shows, please visit the 58 Ember channel, 58ember.com, or find us at 58 Ember Media on socials.